Hey, everybody. Welcome. And today in the studio, we got Gagan Biani. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Neville. So Gagan is the founder of Udemy, which a lot of people probably already know. It's a $3 billion platform that lets people sell courses online. How many how many customers are there or people selling stuff? Do you even know? I, I, so I actually don't remember the numbers. It's, you know, tens, tens of thousands, of, thousands yeah. of, of instructors and tens of millions of students. So so you have a pretty good sense of like the online course uh, community. Y'all were pretty early on into it when like selling information online was still relatively a new thing. And now you are building a cohort-based platform, sorry, a cohort-based courses platform, a CBC. So we kind of wanted to talk to you today about that. And so a cohort-based platform, that is a, that's like the evolution of courses turning into communities, right? So before people would sell like how to make an Excel doc, and now they are selling a community where they say, hey, everyone, let's create Excel docs together. Is that kind of what it's turning into? Yeah, that's a good explanation. Cohort-based courses is a idea that's been around for a few years. I mean, where people on the internet uh, originally were selling just access to content. Mm -hmm. So you pay $10, $500, $1,000, and you get access to a library of videos and and uh, and pre-recorded uh, pre-recorded videos as well as documents that help you learn a given subject, let's say basic Excel um, 101. And today, uh, because of the rise of Zoom and because of the rise of Slack, I think people are much more likely to use uh, to, to want to have more engaging online learning. And so cohort-based courses is just a term that uh, identifies a course that is one in which a group of people start the course and end the course at the same time and therefore are able to build a community together while learning something. So this seems to be the common evolution I've seen. Uh, I, I always tell people within two years, every online course will probably have some sort of community component. I think finally, like you said, the tech is there. The platforms are starting to emerge, but not perfect yet. And it seemed like the evolution was kind of like in the 90s or 2000s. It was like you sell a PDF, right? You charge like 30 bucks, you sell a PDF. Then it turned into videos. Then it was kind of like you get access to the person selling it. So it's like for like 100 bucks extra, you get email access to me. Then it was kind of services. So it's like, I'll also help you do something. And now it seems community. Um, is every, it sounds like it's kind of turning into a SaaS. Like a lot of these are kind of like monthly plans where you join a community and it's a, it's a plan. It sounds like every course is kind of turning into a little bit of a SaaS model, right? Is, is, that, is that accurate? I think there will be courses that SaaSify themselves mm -hmm. and provide ongoing support. Primarily, though, I think most courses will have cohort-based um, approaches where mm -hmm. you have a start and end date. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only so much value that a given topic is going to give you over a period of time. And at some point, you're going to churn out. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a subscription at a very low price, I think most course creators are better off charging a much higher price and having a defined start and end date. So a group of people take the course at, say, March 1st and on March 30th, and by then they've learned everything they need to know about the subject that the instructor is teaching. That is easier on the instructor um, and higher revenue usually because you can charge more for a cohort-based course. And also better for the student because the student commits to a defined period of time, learns a subject, and then can move on. Hmm. That's that's really interesting. I mean, I've done a lot of courses and I mean, we have a company called Copywriting Course and it is actually a community. It morphed into a community about two years ago. And one of the things that we're trying in Q1 is a cohort. And um, here's the reason I don't want to do a cohort every single time. Uh, you have to kind of like launch and start it all the time. There's a lot of activity and it's all condensed into one specific period of time, which I'm sure you know is like a little bit stressful sometimes. And if something goes wrong, it magnifies itself because everyone, you're entire quarter of revenue may be dependent on that or something. Totally. So what are the kind of like the pros and cons of some of these communities? Um, what are the biggest problems you see with communities or cohort based? Are there any problems with it that you see? Sure. I think you named one of them, which is that you have a finite period of time. Some people like that because that means that they are only on for certain times of the year and they can choose when to be on and off. And so mm. there are plenty of people who prefer that to the SaaS model. On the flip side, uh, it's less guaranteed revenue. You have to run and promote your course on a uh, on a per course basis. And so if you are unable, if you're highly reliant upon marketing as the way that you sell courses, this can be quite 
quite exhausting. If you are able to do it via word of mouth and build a wait list or build an audience that wants your course whenever you're available to teach it, then I think that the cohort-based model makes a lot more sense. The other thing to keep in mind is that cohort-based courses today are entirely live, meaning that the instructor is usually pretty plugged in mm -hmm. during the course. I don't think that's necessary for the future. You can create automations and operations within your organization that allow you to run a cohort-based course without having to have the instructor live every single session. And so, I don't know, I, 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 think, that, I think that this model is going to be the model that is bigger in the future. Of course, that's the conclusion I came to after a year of working on this problem. And that's why I'm starting this company. Well, it sounds like this model has already been done by every school and college ever. Yes. And there's usually a reason that that works. People always like harp on college as stupid or so. I don't, I don't know why that's like a popular opinion, but like college is awesome. Okay. Most people that go to college do really well. So it sounds like this is kind of like a tried and true model. You all start with the same objective, right? Versus just like everyone's at a different level. Everyone's at a different, same level, I guess. And then you all end with the same result. And then in the meantime, that makes it easier because you have everyone on the same page to make friends. Whereas if like a business owner versus someone who's just starting a business come into the same thing, it's not, they don't have a lot to relate to sometimes. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cohorts have been the way that education has worked since the dawn of education as we know it or mm. institutional education. It's only with the internet that we started to call online education and you know, I'm I'm guilty of, of making this happen, but uh, online education was just essentially a lot more like buying a book than it was like taking a course, right? When you buy a course on Udemy or Coursera or Masterclass, you don't really take a course. You just buy it and then you go through it. <laughs> That's and a great way to put it. It is kind of like, you because I buy a lot of courses like on Masterclass and stuff and then like I don't watch them or I watch like two seconds of them. It's kind of like putting a book on your table and never reading it. Similar. Totally. I mean, and to be clear, I think books are still super valuable, even though I think something like one in seven or one in eight people, one in eight books that are purchased are actually ever read. Um, that doesn't make books useless. <laughs> I, mean, I love books. It just means that it's a different type of buying behavior and a different type of relationship you have to the product. Cohort-based courses have something like a, you know, somewhere between 75 and 95% completion rate. So it's a completely wow. different ball game. Well, I mean, so we've actually run uh, courses in the past in the, and we, I guess we call them like boot camps and stuff like that. And they actually, it's always a little bit shocking. They do pretty well. Because like you said, you have an end, a start time and a start date, and you have time to kind of get people ramped up and explain why to do something. So we did one about autoresponders and we explained why an autoresponder is so important for the first month and then opened up enrollment to that and it did quite well. So do cohorts need to have a specific topic and a specific deadline? Like what makes a good cohort? Is it like, you're going to be able to do this at the end of this, or does it have some sort of like theme or how does that go? Well, I think we'll see cohort-based courses uh, that have all sorts of value propositions to the user. Uh, I think the vast majority of them will have some sort of learning outcome. So you're showing up to this course to learn how to build a podcast. By the end of it, you should have a successful, uh, successfully launched podcast with maybe 100 listeners or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're taking this course to uh, level up from being a manager to being a director level in product management. This course will hopefully teach you the skills you need by the end of it to go and implement and learn how to become a director. And ideally in the next couple of years, of course, those things are not as perfectly timed with the course the course um, with, with the time you take the course, mm -hmm. uh, but you'll be able to have to become a director. So cohort-based courses and courses in general usually have some sort of learning outcome, but there are uh, course communities popping up or communities really th that are cohort-based that do not have any course element to them. So I would just call this like a cohort-based community, I guess, where you have a group of people who are all interested in the same thing, say we're all people who are looking to get a job in startups and we just meet and hang out for a couple of weeks and we get to know each other and we build a network and relationship that way. Yeah. And there's a company called On Deck that's doing really interesting work there. Uh, it's different though. And I think uh, you know cohort-based courses will make more sense for more people, uh, but I think on deck also is on to some a pretty big business opportunity in, in themselves. Um, 
That's really interesting that you say that. One of the things we learned with our community is like we have like a feed of stuff. And it's really interesting to go through and see what people are working on. It just, I don't know, it just kind of jogs your mind. Um, I know AppSumo and Udemy used to work together a lot, like in the early years of Udemy when like no one knew it. Yep. And y'all were some of our biggest promotions. Um, I remember a lot of people with AppSumo would just sign up just to discover new tools, right? They didn't really intend to buy anything, but they just like the discovery aspect of it. Do you see that in any of these kind of communities? It's just like people are just in it just to kind of like browse, like what, almost like a news feed, like on Facebook, but for a specific topic. Yeah, just on the AppSumo thing, in some ways, AppSumo was like a predecessor to Product Hunt, right? Yeah. I mean, you were providing, uh, you were sharing new technologies and new uh products to your audience. And of course, now you've built this into a huge business. Um, and I say that the same thing is true with cohort-based courses. There will be people who take a cohort-based course solely as a refresher or to learn what the newest, hottest things are in a given mm -hmm. industry. So let's say you're a uh, traditional artist or a designer uh, who's been doing, you know, uh, analog design for a long time and you want to learn how to move into graphic design uh, in the modern era, well, you might take a course uh, that teaches uh, design and how to get a job as a, as, a, as a graphic designer at a startup or a visual designer as they are called today. Um, and they'll teach you Figma and they'll teach, or they'll teach you Canva. They'll essentially teach you the, the, uh, base skills necessary to do the to do this, and they'll also help you get feedback from your peers. So you'll be in a group with other people who are in the same exact position as you. You can learn from them, and uh, you'll have an instructor who is guiding you through the sort of uh, EQ and uh, nuanced challenges of trying to become a designer. Maybe they're gonna teach you how to uh, get a job, what, how to make your resume, how to build your portfolio. These aren't core to learning Figma, um, but they are core to achieving the learning objective of getting a job as a visual designer at a startup. Do you ever see any of these cohorts start out as one thing like, hey, we're gonna teach you how to learn Figma, and then like the 50 people in the class all learn Figma, and now they're like, let's all get jobs. And then they change it to like, let's get a job. Like it just like morphs or does it always stay the same thing and they keep launching the same product? Yeah. I mean, good, good course creators are going to iterate just as startup founders do or, or business owners do. So as they see what people need, they're either going to roll it into the same course and have mm -hmm. sort of a flagship course, or they're going to improve and add, or they're going to add more courses into their catalog right mm -hmm. so i think the model is you know you build one you nail it you get it right and then and during that process you might be doing things like what you said integrating uh, new ideas into that course and then eventually you come up with a new course idea that is uh you know targets a different audience or teaches the same audience a more advanced set of skills mm -hmm. or, or maybe moves more beginner it's totally up to the instructor uh, but the instructor then would you know go ahead and build a new course and hopefully they can then you know build a build an entire business just teaching different types of courses. Nice. So let's talk about the tools required to do this. So it sounds like there's a big gap in the market where there's not a lot of these tools. I know there's kind of, there's Facebook groups, of course, that you can create a community. I guess there's some stuff coming up like circle.so, I, I believe it's called. Um, there's forums. So there's like WordPress forums, which are notoriously horrific. I've used many of them. Um, what do you think are kind of the tools that people need to create a cohort-based platform besides, of course, yours, which you can totally talk about too if, if it's out yet? Yeah, it, it's not out yet. So the uh, traditional stack of a cohort-based course creator uh, is a combination of a uh, of email, which is actually surprisingly the number one way that most course creators communicate with their audience. Mm. Uh, and this is probably the one, the main thing that we want to change or improve. Um, because email is not a very good source of truth for people. It's not a great place to, you know, <laughs> find out what the agenda is for the week, et cetera, because um, you lose it, et cetera. So there's email. Uh, usually there's also a uh, sort of 
lightweight learning man management system like a Teachable, Thinkific, Kajabi, one of those systems that allows you to basically put up a video-based course, mm -hmm. um, then usually there's also a, a document sharing system, either Notion or Google Drive to share uh, uh, more documents and to allow people to templatize the documents and you know copy them over and use them for themselves. There will also be <laughs> uh, a community element, as you said. So Slack is frankly the most common thing that I see. Uh, Discord is also common. Circle SO is extremely popular today and, and is functioning well for this. Um, and there, you named a, a number of others, Facebook groups, et cetera. So I think that uh, and then, of course, on top of all of that, uh, you may also want forum software, which is actually kind of different. So the purpose of Slack and the purpose of Circle are actually a little bit different because Circle is a bit more like forum software and Slack mm -hmm. is a bit more like real-time messaging. So some mm -hmm. courses actually have both. Mm -hmm. um, and that's quite common for more advanced courses. It, it, sounds like, it sounds like depending on what you want to do, there's a, a slightly different stack. I think stuff like hosting the video, like the lightweight learning management system, that'll probably be part of everyone's stuff. But I have some friends that they, they do like trading and stuff. And so trading is very time dependent. And so they do Slack communities. Then there's stuff like ours where we do sales pages and stuff. So some of our posts might be eight, 12, 20 pages long. And then there's a response that's quite long. And then response, response, response. That is physically impossible to do on Facebook groups. We first tried <laughs> it on Facebook groups and it was it was terrible. It didn't, it didn't make any sense. We couldn't embed images within the thing only after or before. It was really silly. So we literally had to move to forum software and then highly customize it to our thing. Um, do you see, what is the most common way that people are running these cohorts right now for some of the bigger, more successful ones you've seen? Slack, Slack is still the most common really? um, but, but by far the, that I see. I mean, look, you're taking software, uh, even the soft forum software you're building, you're using or Facebook groups or whatever, most cohort-based course creators are taking software that's not intended for courses, not intended for the type of uh, sh both short-term interaction. So cohort-based courses are usually short uh, and also not intended for the amount, the depth at which you might want to go, like you said, on a specific subject or in a specific area. Um, and so most people are using tools that are not built for what they're trying to do. So I don't think it's that uh, everyone is always going to use, you know, eight different tools uh, and depending on what use case you have, you're going to use a different one. I'm sure that will exist in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, our hope is to standardize upon one uh, tool that is easy, that is universal and applies to 80 or 90 percent of the use cases that you're talking about. I think your use case of having a community uh, if you decide to, to, to move forward with cohort-based courses, I think we'll nail pretty well this idea of having a long landing page and then having the ability for people to come in and edit and comment. Um, and I think we'll also do well for the traders who are trying to be real-time. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you're trying to build a community that's uh, long-term, that doesn't have a start and end date, there's going to be different services for that. So I think Circle is probably going to be one of the winners there, where mm -hmm. if you want to build a community that's long term that you're going to continue to use for a long period of time, but that maybe doesn't have the kind of engagement that a course needs mm -hmm. um, and maybe doesn't have quite the uh, the uh, other features that a course needs, such as uh, the curriculum, such as popping into a live session, et cetera, um, you're probably going to want to use a cohort based courses platform like what we're trying to build. So oh, yeah. it really depends on it, it will always depend on what you need. But I think for the core use case of a cohort based course, uh, hopefully we'll be able to nail that. Uh, man, it, you you struck a chord with me when you said popping into a, a video classroom, because like, look, I know there's Zoom, I know there's Hangouts, but they're all schedule based and you can have like rooms that you can pop into. But it's been extremely hard when we're we're on our forum. Sometimes I was like, you know, there's times that I'm working for like two hours on this thing. And it'd be nice if people could just like see me work and maybe pop in. It's only members and it's only people that join and pay and stuff like that. That is a shockingly hard thing to solve. And I'm just like, but we have all this technology already and it just doesn't do that stupid thing. Thing. And so uh, I'd be very open to seeing uh, what you have built with this because I'm pretty excited about it personally because it sounds like I'd be the core user of it. It's kind of why I wanted to talk to you. Um, what are the problems you see with Facebook groups? So Facebook groups, as far as I know, kind of took over the forum industry circa 2000s, right? It used to be all these independent forums 
and then it was Facebook groups and then everyone moved to Facebook groups. The problem is that the content stays relatively shallow. I mean, once you start posting beyond two, three paragraphs on Facebook, it gets a little weird looking, it's a little bit hard. You can't embed images. You can't do a lot of formatting. Uh, you can't do a lot of things. So what are the problems you've seen with Facebook groups? Uh, that Do people like move off Facebook groups and, and come to other platforms? What are the biggest problems you see that we can learn from Facebook groups? Yeah, I mean, again, it's not built for the use case that you're talking about. Mm. Um, so Facebook groups, first of all, it's it's owned by Facebook. I, I personally am not <laughs> I'm not hyper political about these things, but I do think that a lot of people just simply don't use Facebook and don't want to be in Facebook all the time. So mm. while I, you know, am going to abstain on discussing the the like political side of whether you should support or not support Facebook, uh, what I will say is that it sucks to be notified by like. 100 different notifications every time you show up to Facebook yeah. and you're trying to learn something, you know, so that's uh, not an optimal, that's not an optimal experience at all. Uh, the second problem with Facebook groups is, as you said, it's shallow. It's designed for, you know, communities to sort of like post and interact, post and interact. It's not designed for conversation, really. Um, and that is more fluid. You know, Slack is much better for that. Uh, and it's also not uh, created for more long form, uh, you know, feedback, which is what I think, you know, products like the form software you're using are, are built for. Um, mm. So it's also not particularly real time. So you can't really build. And it's also very difficult to build one on one relationships with it. So, you know, if you become if you meet someone on a Facebook group, I think the chances that you're going to end up becoming friends with that person and, you know, reach out to them on Facebook is much lower than on Slack. Slack makes that super easy. You feel psychologically more comfortable DMing someone who's in the same Slack community as you mm. than you do DMing someone on Facebook. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, none, none uh, the least of which is not the fact that Facebook has a whole other platform of things that it does other than yeah. groups. And so everything gets muddled together. It also, I feel like Facebook also kind of incur the goal, the old end goal of Facebook is to get you on Facebook and keep you on Facebook, right? And so if someone says like, this is stupid, and then all these people comment against it, it goes, oh, that one got a lot of points. Let's put that at the top of the feed. It actually kind of encourages kind of bad behavior in my view sometimes, or just like shallow, silly, controversial topics rather than like a nice in-depth type of thing. That's been, that was one of the big reasons we didn't like Facebook. And I feel like you lose all the content, right? Like all these people are coming together to make all this great content and answer these questions and stuff like that. And then like on a Facebook group, where does that go? It just goes into the ether. It's nowhere. You just don't, you never see it anymore. So on something like a cohort based platform, is it possible to kind of like dig up that old information and, and index it very easily? Or does it just kind of go in a feed? I hope so. That's certainly <laughs> something uh, I'm going to talk to our team about and see, uh, you know, we're still just getting started. We're going to launch a very basic version so you can launch cohort based courses and, uh, you know, offer it up to the public. We have an incredible number of uh, people reaching out to us, asking us if they can be on the platform. So I think the core user who literally is focused on cohort based courses, no other format of courses, not a subscription course, not a video based course or whatever that that user is reaching out to us in droves. So we're going to focus on them and provide them with a an amazing experience. And from there, we'll add on to other features. So you're talking about a feature that I think we should provide, uh, but maybe in, you know, uh, after we've got a chance to launch and, and have some some people using it and understand what the real needs are. Yeah, I mean, it's the reason I've left a lot of Facebook groups other than that Facebook gets a little bit tiresome sometimes to open up and it's just distracted with too much. But one of the problems I've seen with communities is, is I'll get really excited and it'll be about a topic. Let's say, let's say Figma, let's keep up or Photoshop or something. But then people keep asking the exact same question over and over and over. And it's just like, hey, how do I do this? It's like, this was answered like 45 times in the last week. Like, it, why is it still being like paid attention to? Like, I think it should just be Somehow you keep adding on to a great answer rather than keep on making a new answer over and over and over. It's just like a lot. Of, so that that could be something interesting. Yeah, I think it's seen. a big, it's a, it's, it's a great comment, which is that uh, if a previous cohort, for example, had a question and it was answered thoroughly, how do you surface that so that future cohorts can simply search through the database and under and learn from you know all the wisdom of the past? So 
Yeah. I totally agree. It's a, it's a great piece of feedback. Well, I feel like whenever we have a great thread in our forum or something, it's like an asset, right? It builds the asset a little bit and we can reference it over time versus like it just goes in the ether. Now I have to like do that again and again and again in the 50th time that week. It's, it's, it's a little bit silly to do that in my opinion. So um, one of the last questions is um, how do you keep a community engaged? So let's say there is a cohort of people and they're, they're, I feel like it goes really high in the beginning. Everyone's like real gung-ho and on the same page, but then it slowly tapers off. Are there any ways you've seen people keep communities pretty engaged? This is why we like cohorts because they're for a defined period of time, say two weeks, 12 weeks, three weeks. And so uh, it's much easier to keep people engaged if you have a shared purpose and goal and you provide activities and group uh, you know, projects throughout. So the way that we um, have recommended people to build cohort-based courses, and remember, people will eventually take our software and do all sorts of things with it that we've never mm -hmm. thought of. That's the beauty of software. But for now, we're hands-on helping, you know, six or seven instructors with their courses. And what we do is we make sure that there are, you know, there's a, pro a progress uh, throughout the course and each step of the way or each module, if you will, has a group activity has a project or an individual project where someone is going and eliciting feedback from their peers. And that creates a sort of momentum to the community that keeps it going throughout the two to five week period. Um, so I'm, you know, I can't describe or don't think of myself as an expert on how communities persist for years or decades. You know, you have to talk to the people at Reddit or other mm. uh, really long-term <laughs> communities. Our goal is you come in, you learn something, and you leave. It's like going to college or taking a class, uh, you know, within your company or whatever. You show up for a couple of weeks and we teach you something that you really need to learn and you take that with you. Uh, and then afterwards you build your own one-off relationships and maybe there are alumni events or there are individual people that you keep in touch with or local meetups, um, but it's not the same level of expectation of the community persisting as in a community that maybe is persistent over the course of years and years. Interesting. So I remember when Udemy first started and I was introduced to you or way back then, it was it was kind of a silly idea to sell online courses. It was kind of like so a lot had like a scammy connotation of weirdos selling like, hey, how to make a trillion dollars a day by pushing one button, like that kind of stuff. Uh, it turns out uh, it became pretty mainstream and the, the market cap of Udemy of three billion or whatever it is, it probably shows that. Uh, Teachable was acquired for a large sum of money. Like this is obviously a way moving forward of education. So obviously there's like this big kind of pandemic going on in the world and everyone all of a sudden moved to online Zoom classes and stuff. And while it sucks for a while, it sounds like people are starting to find the cadence of like, oh, you can break out into Zoom rooms or you can chat, or I could just wake up and be in my classroom right away. I don't have to like get ready and go to a college and sit in traffic. So there's actually like all these benefits. So it sounds like you are going after right now, just like an online cohort based model for like, you know, people who teach stuff online like me, but is this going to apply to like all of education? Like how is this different than any class in high school, elementary school, college, grad school? How is this any different? It, it seems like the same thing. It's not. It actually, it is fundamentally the same as any class that you have taken that you prior to being on the internet, you know, and of course you were on the internet, but I'm talking about your real world classes uh, that you were taking. And we believe that is going to be not just the next evolution of online learning, but perhaps even the quote unquote terminal evolution of at least the basic format. So the basic format of a cohort based course to us is was inevitable. I mean, the Internet, what the Internet is not it's it's not as though somehow everything is different online than it was in person. Usually you see a lot of patterns emerge that are similar on the Internet to in person situations. And in this case, we believe education will be cohort based just like the courses you took in university mm -hmm. and we're trying to build a movement to propel that forward and to encourage more and more people to teach great courses on the internet so that people can learn from them so that i can learn from you for example via a cohort which is 
for me, much more appealing uh, for a lot of situations. And so if I can learn from the best people in the world and we continue to build a market for that, then of course the number uh, and the variety of courses will only multiply. So hopefully eventually we'll have courses on subjects that are akin to what you could learn at a university. Uh, maybe you'll also get stuff that's similar to what you can learn in graduate school. And uh, I think that there's a high likelihood that if it's not on our platform, then at least somewhere on the internet, you will be able to take college type courses and uh, graduate style courses, as well as professional style courses on the internet at, you know, five to 10 years from now, I feel like that's going to be totally mainstream. Yeah, that that's amazing. Uh, like, that's why I'm excited about this. Uh, so last question. Um, some examples of good cohorts. I believe I, I did some poking around. It sounds like your founder uh, worked at Alt MBA. Yeah. Uh, Seth Godin's kind of like alternative to an MBA type thing. That's been a cohort based thing for a few years now. Um, are there any good examples that you've seen of good cohorts to emulate or that have done well? Yeah. So Wes actually created the Alt MBA. She was working under Seth as a special projects lead and proposed the idea of building a sort of online business school uh, alternative. And uh, and so she actually has been involved uh, behind the scenes with probably about half of the examples that I would give you for great online cohort-based courses. Mm -hmm. So she helped with uh, David Perel and Tiago Forte's uh, Rite of Passage and Building a Second Brain mm -hmm. more after they had already built their initial courses. So those, those folks uh, built them on their own and did amazing work. David and Tiago are brilliant. Uh, the other uh, people she worked with were, uh, you know, Professor Scott Galloway and his uh, Section Four, uh, which has taken off. Uh, other examples outside of what Wes has worked on are uh, On Deck, as we discussed earlier, Reforge, which does a fantastic job, mm -hmm. and I mean there are countless others. I, I, I'm, you know, friends with people who run product boot camps, who run boot camps for women who want to become uh, more. Uh, who want to learn the unique the unique skills and challenges that they do, how to overcome the unique challenges that they have in the workplace. I have a friend uh, who I actually helped uh, start start his cohort based course on growth marketing, uh, where we help companies and mostly focus on the founders and their direct reports uh, implement a growth marketing regimen into their company. So the possibilities are endless. Awesome. Gagan, thank you so much. That was very helpful. How can people find you? I know you haven't released this yet, but if, if you they want to find you, follow along, how do they find you? The best thing is to go to my Twitter, which is uh, at Gagan Biani. I'm sure you'll put it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. uh, or we also have a public Notion doc that has gotten, I don't know, thousands of views oh. that people are reading, which is basically our website for now. And that's just bit.ly slash WK dash GB. So, well, Wes KO dash GB, Gagan Biani. So bit.ly slash WK dash GB. <laughs> nice. A bit.ly link as a promo. That is a first, man. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on. I appreciate it, Gagan Biani. Y'all can go find him, check out his stuff, and I really can't wait to see what you build. Thanks, Thank man. you, Neville. Hey, how was that video? I thought it was pretty awesome. The cool thing about watching YouTube videos is that you learn things that could possibly change the trajectory of your life. So maybe if you watch one of our other videos, you might learn a thing or two. Maybe not, but maybe you will. I think you will. So maybe you should check out one of these other videos. I hope you like them. This is Neville. Go click.